Okay, let's continue. And let's actually describe for the next hour until lunch how it actually goes about programming computers in order to solve hyperbolic equations. We will be looking at the absolutely simplest hyperbolic equation one can think of. Uh, just the advection equation. This also has the same form as the general hyperbolic system of equations, but we only have one variable and only one dimension, and so all these nasty A matrices turn into a single number, the speed of attraction, which I also set to 1. So, as simple as anything can be. And the afternoon's program is actually guiding you through implementing solutions to the advection equations yourself using a few different numerical algorithms. The big question of solving any type of partial differential equations, uh, there's, there's two big questions. Uh, the one big question is, how do we approximate the your solution that has infinitely many degrees of freedom, uh, a value at every point in space and time, how do we approximate the infinite number of degrees of freedom by a finite number of degrees of freedom? Uh, and we, we will often call the approximation UH. <laughs> Obviously, you need a finite number of degrees of freedom in order for the computer to have any chance of handling. <clears throat> and now that we have the solution approximated in some way, the second big question is how does that solution, how does our approximate solution satisfy the original PDE? In what sense does UH explain? Satisfy all original equation. Let's just call it stuff. And different approaches, different algorithms to solve PDEs will make different choices here how to approximate and how to choose to satisfy and work in the original partial differential equation. The perhaps most well-known way of solving partial differential equation uh, is really, really old and is also quite fairly straightforward to explain and to implement, which is one of the reasons why it is so well-known as well. And this is called finite differences. <coughs> And time permitting, very much I hope so, this is on one of only of three different te techniques I am going to describe to you guys. So in finite differences, um, we take our x-axis and put down a usually uniform grid of grid points x0, xk minus 1, xk, xk plus 1. And again, in the simplest possible way forward, we can also combine this with discretizing time as well. Then we start out with, say, time 0, time 1, time 2. <coughs> and so the solution, we, rep we represent now the solution, let's talk about time later. 
uh, we represent now the solution at discrete points. That we have u of x0, u of x1, and so forth. And so this, this first question now comes in, in that u of x and t is now turning into u of xi, comma, say, tk. And so we have grid points. Say the grid point xk is at h times k, where h is the grid spacing. Oh no, k times delta t. So we have, we actually have managed to get our infinite number of degrees of freedom into, into i equals 0 to n minus 1, however many clip points we have in space. And k is at least countable. But k, the time steps don't really come in so much because we can do them one at a time. As we move forward, we can throw away the solution. So the big thing by finite differences is now how derivatives are approximated. So if you want the time to the, the, the spatial derivative of our solution at point xk, at some time t, we can write this as u of xk plus 1 minus u of xk minus 1 divided by 2 times the grid spacing h. And if we do this, then we make an error uh, that is of order grid spacing squared. We can also um, approximate the time derivative dt u of xk, tj as u of xk, dj plus 1 minus u of xk, dj divided by whatever the, the temporal time series, delta t. If we do this, we can make an error of delta t. So the way these formulas are derived is by Taylor expansions. Looking at the second one first, we can, for instance, write u of t plus delta t is u of t plus u dot delta t plus u double dot delta t squared plus dot dot dot. And if you now want the time derivative, um, you can solve for u, u dot of t, and this is now u of, uh, um, u of t plus delta t minus u of t divided by delta t. And then whatever is left over here in this, this expansion, all the higher order terms in the Taylor series, they turn into the error term. They are neglected, and they give an error as an, uh, the error term, which in, for this particular simple formula is of order delta t. So if you make delta t smaller, the approximation becomes better, but it becomes better quite slowly, only linear in delta t. Approximation based spatial derivatives using an integral of 
Ah, good question. Um, because I can is the short answer, and because it helps. If I play, if I do the, the spatial derivative like this, taking one point to the one, so what I'm doing here is if I want the derivative at this point, I am taking uh, uk plus one, the point to the right, minus uk <coughs> minus one, the point to the left, and divide by twice the grid spacing. Because this is now a symmetric stencil, I go left and right the same way. It turns out the, the, the accuracy of this formula is better. One way to see this is to actually write down both tailors, write down the Taylor series two times. So if I write down u of x plus h, that is u of x plus h u prime of x plus h squared u double prime of x plus h third derivative term h cubed u three derivatives and if I do the opposite with x minus h Same equation except for a few minus signs. <coughs> the trick now is because these are symmetric left right, if I am subtracting, which is what I'm doing here, uh, the leading order term drops out. The second term here is being summed up because the minus sign is cancelled by the subtraction. And this, the, the h squared term now cancels as well. This cancellation comes in because I go left and right symmetrically. The, and then there is the order h cubed term. That one remains, it remains, I can't do anything about that. But this is now h cubed and no longer h squared. The h squared term has cancelled. And so this, this central differences is actually more accurate. So that's the basic idea. We approximate space and time with, with discrete grids. And doing so, we. Uh, so why not do the same thing in time? So? Why not do the same thing in time where you go above and below and so? Because then I would need the, the next time level further back and would need to remember that as well. Such types of methods exist as well. Um, however, they are more complicated to explain. And this, what I'm doing, leads very easily into a way more sophisticated way about thinking time as well. So. But fundamentally, because I wanted to start as simple as I can. If you now take all these, these discretizations, um, just naively uh, substitute them into the equation that I've just erased, what we find is that we find now that u of x i comma t k plus 1 <coughs> minus u of x i comma t k divided by delta t is equal to u of x i plus 1 comma tk minus u of x i minus 1 comma tk divided by 2h. If you solve this for the new step, u of x i comma tk plus 1, this is sitting here. 
this will be u of x i comma t k minus delta t times the spatial derivative. So this is the very same term term so I've already written down over there, no change. And now suddenly I have an expression where on the right hand side this is all data at time tk and given all the data at time tk all the different grid points Um, we now have an expression on the, right, the left-hand side that tells us what the data will be at the next time step. And so if you start with the set of, of grid point values at, at a given time, this excessively simple formula will now tell us what the values of the grid points are at the next time. This actually works in practice, kind of. When you're doing this in practice, there will be two difficulties going around. The first difficulty is, if you go from time tk to time pk plus 1, if you look how information is being propagated around, is that if, say, you want to find this grid point here in the new solution, it depends on its direct ancestor before, just going up, and it depends on the grid points left and right. <coughs> so we're, we're taking these three input points to compute a certain output. If now the time step is, is small, all of this works fine. If, however, if the time step is larger than the, the spatial grid spacing, if I'm trying to go too far into the future, um, Remember that information propagates in this inductive equation with the speed 1. If I'm now taking time steps bigger than, than the basic, uh, spatial grid spacing, that means that the information, the equation demands at that point, actually needs to come from further away than just one grid point. And this doesn't make sense if you think about it. It also means that in that, those cases, this type of evolution system becomes unstable. Now, this type of, of instability of large time steps is, related, is, is attached to the name Courant. Uh, there's a current condition uh, and this is essentially true not only for what I've just written down but for all explicit uh, evolution methods Namely, that the time step has to be smaller than a constant times the spatial grid spacing for stability.
Um, explicit means that the new solution is even as simple expressions of the old solutions without having to solve big complicated systems of linear equations coupling all the grid points. Um, this precise constant here is proportional to the speed of information propagation and it also depends on the precise details of the algorithm. For some algorithms this number can be bigger or smaller but it's always of order unit. So this is the one issue with, with uh, forward Euler. You can't take two big time steps. The second issue with forward Euler is that the solution actually will not work long term because of difficulties with forward Euler. <coughs> Nevertheless, if you actually just solve forward Euler on computers, this works remarkably well, or oh, this works. Um, here's the precise solution uh, we're going to look at this afternoon. It's a cosine 2 pi x as initial data, this, this blue thing here, um, with the exponential to make it look a little bit more interesting. Solutions of the advection equation propagate right at unit speed. And so at x and t, the solution just uh, translates like x minus t. And so first the solution is going to the left, 0.1, 0.2. And then after a while, because of periodic boundary conditions, the solution comes back in, leaves on the right hand side, and comes back in on the left hand side. Um, implementing this with forward Euler, uh, one can achieve this type of quite complicated looking plot. The important thing about any numerical solution is to make sure that as you increase resolution, you're actually approaching a the true solution that the, so the, the codes are convergent. And so what I'm doing here is I am plotting the solution with different numbers of finite difference grid points and different numbers of time steps. If you look first at, and this plot has a lot of information on it, so let's try and go through it quickly. When I say I'm plotting the solution, what's actually plotted here is the error, the difference between the analytic solution that I know in this particular case and what the solution with forward Euler tells me. And so generally, as I increase the solution, the curves go down, the solution becomes more accurate. And generally, as I decrease the time step, the error goes down because with smaller time step, the time stepping error becomes smaller. <laughs> if you now look at this for, for the largest possible time steps, here, 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 and here, those are cases where the time step is too big and the current condition is not satisfied, and so everything blows up. To make the time step smaller, things get better. And so the, the typical shape of one of these curves is that, if you, for instance, focus on the, on the wet curve, is that if you have the time step small enough, the error is the same, the time step error doesn't change anymore, because it's already much smaller than the spatial error. And if you make the time step larger, the error goes up, because at some, some point the forward Euler time step shows up and messes you and, and becomes bigger than the, time <coughs> the spatial discretization. As I double the number of grid points, this error goes down by factors of four, as it should be, because we had the spatial discretization 
good to grid spacing squared. So every time you double the number of grid points, the solution becomes four times as accurate. Okay, but the difficulty here is that in order to actually realize this type of, of precision that the spatial grid is capable of, we have to go to excessively small time steps. Typically, the, uh, the codes should, should run correctly for current limit, current factors close to one, when you take the time steps. But here we have to go down to one half, a quarter, an eighth, a sixteenth, a thirty-two, one over sixty-fourth times the ideal time step in order to get the time discretization error small enough uh, that we can actually realize the full accuracy of the spatial grids that we have. And this is because the time discretization order of our Ford Euler is so pathetically small. And so to do better, we need to think about how to do better in terms of keeping track of the time steps. One way to do this would be what uh, was asked for earlier. Why don't I just use a centered time stepping that keeps the, the last level and then the centered final difference in time? If that works. It would give us second order in time. Um, but it's much less powerful than generalizing the way you think about the equations. And that's what we're doing now. Let's, let's get away from also discretizing time for a second. We'll come back in a few minutes. But let's think about the system only in discretizing space first. Um, so this will end up with a method called uh, method of lines, so we can put this as title of the sections. Let's discretize the space. And now our advection equation, so we have u at grid points. But we keep the continuous time. And now our evolution equation will be du at the grid points time derivative is on the right hand side still our finite difference tensor. And what we now gain from this is as follows. Now let's consider all the grid point values as a vector. So we have a vector u that consists out of u of x zero comma time, u of x one comma time, all the way up to whatever the last point is that you happen to have, u n minus one comma time. That vector is still time dependent. And that vector at a certain time, it gives us the, the solution at each grid point. That's the solution we have. And if you talk about vectors, now this equation here becomes a du vector dt is equal to some right hand side f of u. Where this right hand side is also vector value and it consists of just some combination of different elements of, of the u vector. In this point of view, this is now a system of ordinary differential equations. For this vector u. And once we have it written as 
such a system of ordinary differential equations, we can now attack it with any type of time stepper solution algorithm that we can find and that we know about that works for ordinary differential equations. Any ODE solver. And the only thing we need for it is we need to have this right hand side coded. And then we can uh, use whatever cool or also cool ODE solver we can think of. And that way, control the time stepping errors to much better degree than what we just did before. Ford Euler, of course, is still here. So, just to put down a few possible ODE solvers. Ford Euler is would be the simplest possible ODE solver you can think of. And that basically would be u of k plus 1. So this is the solution at time t k plus 1. Is u of k plus delta t times f at t k comma u k. So we still get four Euler back if we want to in this method of fine spectra. But now it's really easy to do better. One very easy way to do better is called Honey Cutter 2. And that starts out with one right hand side evaluation. W1, f of tk, uk. It then does a second right hand side evaluation. Going forward, half of quip spacing. With the W1 that we have just computed. So, so far, this looks like half a step of forward order. And then we get the new solution as the old one plus this W2. Uh, just writing down the algorithm doesn't, doesn't really tell you much. But let's, let's actually sketch what's going on here. If we have time going to the right, and in units of our time step, and say the solution is going up. Then say at one time step k, we have a solution somewhere. And the right hand side, f of u, is the slope of the solution. So the slope here is f of and what now forward Euler does is you take the slope and you just run for it until your next time step. And this is now directly uk plus 1. So what this omega 2 does is kind of similar, but a little bit more sophisticated. We still have k, k plus 1. So at k, we have u k. And again, we compute the slope. And this is stored in this variable. 
Now we go forward by half a time step, and we end up here with this intermediate point. at which we compute the slope again. This cannot be a different slope. Because we compute this different slope in the middle of the prospective time step, if the actual solution is curved, say it behaves more like this, then the slope in the middle of the time step will be a better approximation of the average slope within the time step from left to right. And so now what forward Euler does, what, what Bonnekata 2 does, is it takes this slope in the middle of the time step and moves it down to our original point and takes this average slope for the entire time step to reach then somewhere here, UK plus one. And there's no need to stop there. The good thing about Monte Carlo too, this is this is has an error term that's quadratic in delta d, whereas forward Euler had an error term that is linear in delta t. So forward Euler is first order, tonic Hutter is second order. <coughs> so if I try to repeat everything with Hange Hutter 2, then things look actually a lot better. Oh, I have Runge Cutter 4. So let's 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 jump directly to Runge Cutter 4. Um, once you begin realizing this type of system that you can compute multiple right hand sides and then combine them in a smart way, there's basically no boundary to uh, how far you can push this game. <coughs> One very famous method is called Wange Cutter 4 because it is fourth order accurate in time, so really accurate already. This blue pen is vicious. I can't erase it. But Wange Cutter 4 is still simple enough to write down quickly. So the first few things are exactly as before. W1 is f of dk uk. And now there's a bunch of intermediate steps. W2 is f of dk plus one half delta t uk plus one half w1 w3 is the same uh, except that you have v2 instead uh, replaced by v1 oh, let's split it up And W4 is now a full time step ahead. So just to highlight where all the, where the differences are, here we have W1, here we have W2. And here we are going a full time step, not just a half time step. And we have W3. And then, once you have called your function f four times, 
or can I combine everything together into the new solution? With a little bit more complicated formula, but still nothing too exciting. Still, it's, it's short enough formulas that they can be put on the blackboard very, very effectively. And the nice thing here is this thing is now fourth order accurate. So just a few more lines of code get us from needing to do a silling of time steps to potentially way, way fewer time steps. And if I now look at this, this convergence test again, I take the scalar with the, this pulse and drag it heavily to the right. I guess you write it this way. Then um, the error one gets after evolving a certain period of time no longer depends in any way on the time step. And this is because the Van Cutter method being fourth order in time, and because we must take a time step that is proportional to delta x, is always more accurate than the spatial discretization. So we can now actually run at a maximum current factor of 2. So this is now a time step of 0.1. So it's a, um, whereas beforehand, we had to use a lot smaller time steps. Note that this only starts at, at point one, it's not even on the scale. We can take much bigger time steps and still, this way, have the time stepping problem under control and getting, quite, getting errors that only depend on what you're doing in space, and no longer what you're doing in time. Cool. Of course, if in this situation you just use the biggest time steps you can without the system blowing up, and you still get as good as you can, but we're still at the situation where to reach an accuracy of 10 to the minus 3, we need to have 600 spatial grid points. In one dimension, this is not a problem. 600 grid points fit on the laptop in two seconds. Who cares? However, if you now want to play this game in 3D, if you have 600 grid points in X, in Y, and in Z, 600 cubed is a very, very large number. And so, there's a big encouragement to cutting down the number of grid points you need in space while still preserving accuracy. For the forward oil method, uh, isn't the error uh, smaller if you work directly with the second one? Uh, probably, yes. Yeah. So there's, there's always uh, variations you can play based on the complete equation that you're working with. You can just Directly discretize second order equations in time, especially with, with finer differences, but not so much for the other methods I'm going to describe next. Those are much more tailored for first order systems. I'm trying to keep the, the discussion here general, but they cannot do all systems and equations. Is the limitation in just continuing to up the order of Ron Kata that eventually you're just taking? All right, I'll stop. Excellent. So Rangel Cutter 4 is very famous because it is still very easy to derive and very easy to implement and all looks handy dandy and I can write it down in a, in a few minutes. You can also do a lot more fancy things. So one of the really fancy things that is these days quite famous is dormant prints. Uh, eight, five. You can get the coding numerical recipes. So what this is, this is an eighth order. Why stop at four? Um, it uses 13 function evaluations. So it's, it's about three times more work as one cutter, but you get an error that decays as time step to the eighth instead of time step to the fourth. It also has 
this is, this is, now it gets really cool. You can use the same. So these 13 evals give you intermediate results W1 to W13, as in one we cut over here. You can combine the same <coughs> to, to also get a third and a fifth order method. So you can, you may take one time step to get the really fancy eighth order update for the next time step. But with all the work you have done, you can also get a third and a fifth order update. Those are less accurate, but the differences between the course and the, and the good updates give you an information of how big your error is. So with these coarser, with these other embedded methods, you can do adaptive, step, adaptive step size control. And that will actually take big or small time steps depending on what your accuracy requirements are. What else? You can also you can also use the VW uh, plus three x four uh, for interpolation. to dk plus a partial time step. So these high order methods take humongously large time steps. You want them to run at large time steps to be efficient, but if now the time step goes from 1.7 to 2.1, and you want the solution at two, now what do you do? Turns out, with this embedded interpolation formulas, you can now take the data you currently have and output the solution at two without any extra work. So there's a lot of cool things in these fancy methods that one can use. In principle, they work exactly like, like the Range cutter I've just written down there. What we have here, for instance, is the implementation of Torment Prince 853 in, in spec. And let me see where it is. Uh, yes, here we go. For int i equals 0 to 12, Compute a linear combination of, of the previous Ws that you already have. And then do a right hand side evaluation to compute the next W. And so here, the Ws are, are computed one after the other. And down here, eventually, is this sum of all the different Ws, which in Range Cutter, I still could write down by hand here without difficulties. And so the structure is totally identical, even in these fancy methods. Where the difference comes in, and where you really need somebody who knows what they are doing, is in developing these methods, is in working out the coefficients. So here's the set of numbers of coefficients that go into, into the Storm and Prince 853. And there are people somewhere in this globe who, who work out all these numbers in order to make methods work that have all these nice properties. And so this these big set of, of about 70 or so uh, constants replace what in Dorman, what in Range Cutter 4 are the one halves, the one six, and the one two two ones. The structure is the same, but the details become a lot more, more complicated. But you can end up with really fancy time steps. Are these all rational? 
I don't know. <laughs> okay, so method of line gets the time stepping difficulties under control. Either simply with one color four, which you can still type in by hand, or pretty fancy with Storm and Prince and others, where you need to find out all these coefficients from the respective papers or from the recipes. And now we are back and trying to improve the, the spatial discretization. And this is where, first of all, spectral methods come in. Um, I hope some of you here have heard of the spec code, uh, the spectral Einstein code, that solves Einstein's equations not with final differences, but with spectral methods. And so the, the idea of spectral methods is to, is to improve on the just putting down a re re regular grid in X and trying to do something smarter there. Um, and one way to do better is to consider one way to do better is to no longer think of grid points, but to think, think in terms of basis functions. So we have, say, if over u of x comma t, and this we now approximate again as an as a as a approximate solution to h of x comma t. And this now you write down as a series in some basis functions with some expansion coefficients in front of it. UK and so we might start at zero and we might go up to some expansion order n. The approximation here comes in not by choosing grid points but by having a finite number of basis functions. By truncating in the number of basis functions. And now you might ask, why would you want to do that? A simple example why this is useful is the Fourier series. So in the Fourier series, you would have u of x is a sum k goes from 0 to infinity. Actually, I'm using n. I should stick to my notes because the next equations are so often that otherwise I will mess up. And the important thing now is, if you want to compute a certain mode, I'm moving the way you can do this is with, with an integral minus pi to y u of x e to the minus i m x dx. Um, in all of this, I'm assuming that u is 2 pi periodic. i.e. that x goes from, from minus pi to pi. And if you're computing Fourier coefficients, you, there's, a, there's a factor of 2 pi coming in, which is of no big, big use, but I should put in for completeness. So far, this is not new. I, think, I hope you've seen all of this before at some point. Where this becomes interesting, if you now do the magic trick that almost always helps in math, and that is integrating by parts. If we integrate by parts, we get a constant term, i over n 
u of x e to the minus i and x could be minus pi and plus pi. And we get a left over integral, a minus i over n integral minus pi to pi u prime of x e to the minus i and x dx. The beauty now with is, is that this first term here vanishes because of periodicity. If you now integrate my parts again, we get one more term u prime of x e to the minus i by x minus pi over pi and we get another boundary term and we get another integral over here minus pi to pi u prime the double prime of x e to the minus i x dx and the first thing again vanishes if it was periodic. And you can actually continue integrating that parts. And so after k integrations by parts, um, what do we have? We have our 2 pi cm goes like, so if we integrate it once by part, we get a 1 over n. <coughs> if we integrate it twice by parts, we get a 1 over n squared here, I've forgotten to write down this 2. And if we integrate it k times by parts, we find that the coefficient goes like 1 over k to the n. Um, if u is smart, if u is smooth, c infinity, uh, then we can integrate arbitrarily. Then, then we can integrate arbitrarily often. Why not one, no one, one over n to k? Thank you. Uh, Can integrate arbitrarily often, so this must hold true for any k. So the Fourier coefficients decay faster than any finite power of k and hook into the k. They decay exponentially. And that means if we really have some new functions we want to approximate, we can do so, we can get an error term that is not a power of the number of, of degrees of freedom, but an exponential of the degrees of freedom. So we get much higher accuracy for a comparable number of degrees of freedom. At that point, there's a few things you should be pointing out to me. Number one, C infinity. This only works for smooth solutions. Yes, spectral methods won't do much for you if you don't have smooth solutions, if you have shocks, for instance. Uh, 
that's a shortcoming. Number two, Fourier series work only for periodic data. It's great to have a periodic integral from minus pi to pi, but real life is more complicated. Um, and if you have non-periodic systems, Fourier series won't help you. However, the nice thing is there's also similar sets of basis functions that work for non-periodic non problems. The two most famous ones are Chebyshev polynomials and the Schmontre polynomials. And both of these also have this exponential convergence properties if the data is smooth, even when the solutions are not periodic. So the periodicity is not the problem. Now a final really cool thing about spectral methods is that you don't even have to throw away your finite difference code. You can actually use, or, uh, at least for the invection problem, you can just stick to the same uh, finite difference code. So how do you how do we implement spectral methods? Again, in being simple here, just in, in very advanced conditions. In um, with periodic boundary conditions, it's actually quite interesting. We use a uniform grid. So we still have our grid points at x j equals um, j over n, uh, j going from 0 to n minus 1. And now when you're doing the Fourier integral, of the expansion coefficients, we approximate this with a sum at the grid points. So this is a sum of the grid points. We have u of xj, we have, I guess I need to be careful with the two pi's. If I have my integral going from minus pi to pi, then I should have my grid points going between minus pi and pi. Or so actually, let's change the integral to go from 0 to 2 pi. And let's put my grid points also covering the integral from 0 to 1. e to the minus i n x j. If I do this, the sum, I need to put in a prefactor. Each one of my points has a weight of 2 pi of n. And if I now go one step further, Um, this exponential turns into a e to the minus 2 pi i m j over n. 
And this comes because I was using that formula over here. This is a this is the typical formula for a fast Fourier transform. So, what we're reading the documentation, uh, almost any numerical analysis, computer library, will have routines called fast Fourier transforms that can evaluate this type of expression very, very effectively. The biggest problem in using fast Fourier transforms is to actually read the documentation and making sure all the two pies and index placements and, and, and conventions are satisfied. So, what we now have is we have a uniform grid, and having the grid point values. It's trivial, but it's quite easy to go to the spectral coefficients. Now, having the spectral coefficients, uh equals a c <coughs> cn e to the i and x, it's trivial to take a derivative. So we have, the, we have the coefficients of the, we can write the derivative of u as a sum of cn. So if you take the derivative, the in comes down, e to the inx. So this is again This is again a spectral expansion of the very same type we just had for function u. And so now we can take an, an inverse Fourier transform to get the values of the derivative of u at the grid points. First we did an FFT, then we can apply the current relations, we get the coefficients of the derivative, and then we can do the FFT. And so this now is a algorithm that you can use to compute f of u, the right hand side of our equation u dot equals f of u. And what you get from this is actually quite astonishing. Here's again the slides I started out with. So this is for this particular example, so a, this, this peak-shaped thing advecting heavily along. Recall that for finite differences, uh, we needed 600 points to get an accuracy of 10 to the minus 3. With pseudo-spectral methods, this plot looks like this. The 10 to the minus 3 lives now at 12 basis functions. And if I'm crazy enough to go up to 32 basis functions, I get an error of 10 to the minus 13. And so here, this equal spacing, as I'm increasing the number of basis functions by 4, is exactly the, the exponential convergence that you're not multiplying by the num you're not multiplying the number of grid points. Here, here I'm multiplying the number of grid points by two to get a fixed factor improvement. But here with the spectral methods, 
I am adding a certain number of clip points to get a certain factor of improvement. When they work, they can be astonishingly accurate. Um, of course, this also now plays in the fact that now suddenly the running cutter 4 is a limiting step. So at, at largest time steps, this line down here, this is exactly the time stepping error of running cutter 4. And if I want to resolve the 10 to the minus 13, eventually I can make the time step small enough to actually have the running cutter 4 error under control. But by this time, I am taking time steps about a thousand times smaller than I could based on, uh, on stability of, of the methods. And this is the reason why now suddenly this really fancy dormant prince eight order methods are important and can help further speeding up these types of codes. So you can, you can do a lot of really cool things if you know what you're doing moving forward. Sorry, so now at each step you have uh, an f of t and an inverse f of t to take a derivative. So I guess some things are more expensive now numerically. Um, I guess this is usually swamped by the savings you get by going to smaller goods. So thank you for keeping me honest. There's, there's two things going on here. The one is what you just described. Each time step is a lot more expensive. But this is, this is swamped by the higher efficiency you get. The other thing that's going on is that if you play this thing on periodic domains, you keep the same grid spacing age, which is fairly large grid spacing. If you're doing non-periodic domains, however, what happens is the grid points tend to be no longer equally spaced. You have clustering of grid points near the edge of the domains. And so again, you're forced to taking smaller time steps than for finite one's goals. Um, both of these eat up some of the advantages, but typically still plenty of advantages remain if you have a problem where you can use spectral methods. That's the big if, and that's the point down to uh, is the problem actually sufficiently smooth? Can you, can you go back to the last slide, please? Yes. So, your number of point, not all of them. Uh, log two numbers. So you do, you just fill, when you do your fast Fourier transform, you just fill it with zeros? Or? Um, yes, so fast Fourier transforms are most e efficient for powers of two. Actually, for these small numbers, fast Fourier transforms are awfully inefficient to begin with. I didn't you pay can. any attention to it. The Python library does whatever it does. Um, it will fill something in. At these small numbers, Probably a matrix multiplication would be more effective than just a fast Fourier transform. Okay, so these are two of the three methods I wanted to discuss. And in the homework set for this afternoon, I had said. Uh, as assignments to code first find the difference methods and then the spectral methods. Plus I also had said um, my current favorite method of all, discontinuous Galerkin. The difficulty is I, I would like to um, explain discontinuous Galerkin as well, but I'm woefully behind time here. And The question is, can I run even further over time than, than I already am or not? So we have an hour and a half for lunch, so we can maybe eat in a little bit of lunch. How long do you need? I am awfully bad in estimating how long things take. I was worried that I would not have enough material. You want to try a special method of <laughs> Okay. So, let, let me give you the gist of, of discontinuous Galerkin. The, the difficulty of spectral methods, as I just said, is that if you have discontinuities and shocks, spectral methods are really bad. Discontinuous Galerkin methods try to, to combine 
a lot of advantages of a lot of different methods. Here's what's, what's going on. I'm still looking at my favorite interval going from 0 to 1. And what you do in this continuous Galerkin is you split the interval, you split your domain into elements. For special methods, you only did one global expansion of an entire interval 0 to 1. For this continuous Galerkin, We take our, our interval going from x0 to xn and split it into, uh, into individual elements. These elements can be of different width, as I've indicated here. So the first one here would be d0. This one here would be dk minus 1. This one here would be dk. On each of these elements, we now write down a separate polynomial approximation. So we approximate u by its discretized version uh. We do so on the element k. And we approximate as a sum. This is again crazy enough that I need to be careful what basis functions to use. Um, we approximate in terms of some basis functions. So L J K of X, uh, the sum runs from zero to some M, and you have some expansion coefficients U H K J of time. So it's the same idea as for the for the spectral methods. Uh, the notation becomes more clumsy, but we still have basis functions with coefficients at one. Here's a few examples of how this looks like. If I pick and those basis fun yeah, and those basis functions. They span the polynomial order up to polynomial order n. If I'm using n equals 1, polynomial order 1, I only have two basis functions in each element and two grid points in each element, just the endpoints. And in each element, my solution is represented by a linear function, straight line. If I have n equals 2, I go up to polynomial order 2. In each element, I have three grid points. And in each element, the function is now represented by a parabola. For polynomial order 3, there's now four grid points in each element, and this is a third order polynomial, a cubic. And as the order goes up, here's order four, it's now a fourth order polynomial in each element with five grid points. So the solution is uh, adaptive in the sense that we have the different elements, which we can make wide or small. And it's, it's adaptive in the polynomial order in each element. And what this makes us is that 
we can do a B refinement uh, we can increase the order n in some elements and this recovers basically uh, exponential convergence uh, when the solution is smooth and we can also do H refinement uh, essentially cut elements in pieces Um, when, this, when the solution has shocks. The basis functions are mostly flexible and can be used a wide variety of functions and the, the method still works. However, it seems the customary choice that works quite well are the short polynomials. But if with the time I will skip the part about the Lachandre polynomials. And now the, the big question is we've written down our expansion of, of how we want our solution to look like. We have chosen a set of basis functions in which we want to represent the solution. But we now need to turn this type of, this is the form we want to have, into a set of equations for these unknown, unknown coefficients. If we know the coefficients, we can evaluate the solution. And so the task is, we need to get equations for our coefficients. And this is now where the other big improvement in fanciness comes about from their finer differences, is how equations are derived for these coefficients. Let's consider a partial differential equation in what's called flux form. So we have dutt plus df dx equals perhaps some right hand side. The right hand side isn't really that necessary, but it helps in keeping track of where each term goes in the equation. This flux u, flux f, is a function of u. And this is where this form of the equation differs from what I had written earlier. For the advection equation, Uh, the flux is just u itself. The nice thing here is, if you compare to earlier, we had the a partial u sitting here. The nice thing about writing it as a, as a complete divergence, 
which is often possible but not always, is it allows integration at once. So this is the equation we want to solve. And now if you if we take the if you take our approximation, we can evaluate this very partial differential equation on our approximation, and what we end up with is UHPT. Okay, so this is now all on, on element TK. Um, substituting in our expansion for the UTT. We substitute in the expansion into the flux and get it just a, a approximated flux. The H is again the symbol that we have put in the approximation. And we are substituting in we'll be keeping, keeping the chi as it is. So the chi is just a function that goes along for the right. And this now, we want to, have, want to set equal to zero, but we now need to decide what we mean by setting things equal to zero. All of this here are functions of x and t. But we only have a finite number of degrees of freedom. We only have all these expansion coefficients to choose. And if we only have, say, five expansion coefficients, we can't satisfy this for any choice of x. We need to make sacrifices, compromises. And the, what really worked well is not to satisfy this at a certain grid point, but to try to satisfy this in an average sense, integrating over the element. And you want to really make this, the quantity you want to try to set to zero, the trick is to force this to be orthogonal to the very basis functions you are using to define the basis. So by, by multiplying with the basis functions integrating, we now have a we force the residual to be orthogonal to the basis functions. And that coincidentally uh, forces the low polynomial terms here to be zero, and it also coincidentally gives us exactly the right number of equations that we have given the degrees of freedom. Okay, so far we have not at all worked in anything about boundary conditions between the different elements to cover them together. And so we now need to do some more magic to couple things together. The trick once again is integration by part. If you integrate by part, the second term uh, the first term remains The third term remains. Uh, what do I do this? Uh, let me spell this out, otherwise it's going to be confusing. The first term remains d u h k d t, and it still has the same l j k. No surprise. The second term is the one we integrate by bond. So now the flux doesn't have a derivative anymore but the derivative moved on to the basis function. And the last term stays as it is. If 
if you integrate by bar, we get a bound integral. And this is where the magic comes in. This is the minus FHK LJK evaluated at the two boundaries of the order okay. <coughs> And so far, at the boundary xk, where the domain dk hits the domain dk plus 1, we have two of these fluxes. At this point, we have a flux from the left domain, we have an fk of xk, and we have a flux from the, from the right domain, fk plus 1, also evaluated at the same grid point. So the one is this at the very right edge of the left domain, the other is at the very left edge of the right, of the, the right domain. And because our two elements are so far independent of each other, all the data will be typically different from each other. And now comes the truly magic that, that makes this whole method work is to take the two fluxes and define the unique flux. F star of xk. Uh, it is used in both left and right domains. And that leads now to this very same equation again. Except that now this fk turns into a this unique flux. How this is done is a big piece of magic I really don't have time to go into. But making a wise choice there is what makes a lot of difference. Once one has this f there, we integrate by parts then. Then we end up at the left side with three terms. The first one is the one that we always had. D U H K D T. The middle term, if we move the, the dead partial derivative back on the left hand side, we also get back the equation that we have started out with. D F K H dx, and the g is the g, l j k dx. And on the right hand side, we have the one that we have just put there. That one hasn't disappeared. But we have integrated again, so we get yet another boundary term. F H K 
times L J K. All of this seems like magic. And I actually don't really know why it works, but it works remarkably well. So we now have this equation. And now it's time to, to evaluate polynomials. And this is where things get really crazy. Because now suddenly everything begins to fall into place. So we substitute in that our UH K is an expansion in basis functions. So what we have here is, and so now what, what comes out of this is we have the big sum over i, this is this sum. Then here we have a time derivative, u dot, one of the expansion coefficients. And then we have the inner the integral of the Li from here and the L chain that we already had. In the middle term, we know oh, let's finish this one first. We know the basis functions. So this integral can be evaluated and it turns into a matrix in the high chain. In the middle term, we have a plus the expansion coefficients for f, if which for our optimal example are the same as the expansion coefficients for u, because f equals u. It's nice to keep the f here anyway to keep track where terms come from. The coefficient goes out of the integral, and what's left is uh, we have li with a derivative, dli dx of x, lj of x dx. Again, you have integrals of the basis functions with each other. And this thing is called S J I. So the, the derivative index is always by convention placed last. For the G, again, you have the uh, expansion of G K I H multiplying one L from G, one L from here, so this is again the N matrix. And we have the right hand side terms. So now suddenly this turns into a M matrix multiplying the time derivative of the vectors vector U plus S matrix multiplying the vector flux minus M matrix multiplying G. This minus sign here should have this plus sign should have been a minus sign all along. And on the right hand side, we have the flux terms. And now, it might sound crazy, but I'm two lines away from the end. We can divide this equation. I'll put it over here. 
by m. If you divide by m, you now get u dot plus m minus 1s f minus g equals, and now I need the right hand side. M minus one and F star minus F. HK, LJK, XK, XK plus one. Okay. Now comes the. So far, we haven't paid attention to what the basis functions are. But now let's choose basis functions. that are noble. So we have a set of points, and each basis function is required to be zero at our set of points, except for the, for the point that goes along with it. So we have a set of points. I I equals zero m and the L J is defined such that L J of R I is delta H J. If you now look at your at our expansion U H K of x is the sum u h k i. L i k of x. Because our basis functions are notable, that each one only has one point where it's not zero and the other one zero. If we take the solution at the grid points, this sum will collapse to a single spectral coefficient. So with the nodal basis, this U is still, are still U are still grid points values. And on the right hand side, the right hand side term um, will also simplify. Um, because what we have is we have an n minus 1, f star minus fk, let's put it out, we have an f star of x plus 1 minus fkh xk plus 1 
times LJKXK plus 1. This turns into a delta function. Only one, one element remains. And we have the same thing at the lower boundary. Hkxk, Lkxk, and again, this turns into a delta function for the first element. So this whole thing collapses into a the inverse matrix for the first two terms. Um, for the first two terms, we only need the nth element. So this would be an I n f star minus f k h. And for the last element, This would only be the first row of this matrix. Again, f star, this time at xk, minus fkh of xk. This is at xk plus 1, xk plus 1. So we actually end up at the end of the day, although this has been so fast that it's nearly impossible to have followed, with a set of equations that on the left hand side, um, has the quid point values within one domain multiplied by just a few quite trivial matrices that one can compute ahead of time. And then those different elements are coupled with these nasty looking fluxes here that, uh, except of keeping type of rotation and indexing the overall vectors, um, magically actually enforce solutions to be continuous and, and coherent across different domains. And at the end of the day, one now has two degrees of freedom that one can play around with. So one has the expansion order n, assuming it is the same for each element, and we have the number of elements. If the expansion order is low, like one or two, up here, one sees fairly slow convergence with the number of elements, because uh, we have low polynomial order. And if we crank up the expansion order n, one can get quite fast convergence, uh, for instance, reaching 10 to the minus 12 accuracy with, with only about 16 elements. And now we can reach our 10 to the minus 3 level of accuracy, either by having, say, 8 elements, each one of order 4. 8 times 4 is 32 grid points. Or we could do 2 elements of order 10 with 20 grid points. So we have a method that still, because of it, uses underlying uh, expansions and basis <coughs> functions, it can converge quite quickly if one cranks up the, the, the expansion and basis functions. But we have the flexibility built in of, of not using multiple domains and adopting that with geometry and in question. Okay, sorry for running so awfully over time. Um, 
The afternoon worksheet is, provides instructions for actually implementing finite differences, spectral, and, and discontinuous coverting methods. Uh, I will be around, of course. Uh, my realization has been even before that the worksheet is quite long. So I hope you will work through finite differences in spectral, and I hope that a, some of you are ambitious enough to also try discontinuous coverting. Thank you very much. Thank you.